Let us join together our voices in our opening prayer. How magnificent the sight must be. The vision of John proclaims a crystal river flowing from God's throne. Peace and hope for all people. Darkness is vanquished. Open our eyes and our hearts to catch a glimpse of this vision. Help us to place our trust in you, that we may faithfully serve you, knowing what awaits our eyes in glory. Amen. Please be seated. We come now knowing we have committed a few faults maybe this week or in weeks past, and we ask forgiveness. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. We have not yet to learn to love as you love. We have spoken praise in our mouths when our hearts were far from you. The gifts you gave for our peace we have weaponized. Yet, even in our failings, your love has never failed us. Even when you turned away, you still chose to make your home among us. Our hearts are troubled. We are enmeshed in fear. Creation needs you. Our families need you. Our streets need you. Our cities need you. The soil needs you. Our souls need you. Heal us. Forgive us. Make us whole again. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Beloved of God, hear the good news. God's faithfulness is sure. God's love will not fail us. In accordance with God's loving kindness, you are forgiven. You are welcome. You are home. Comes out of the rules. 
We pray not only for missionaries on foreign soils, but also for the rest of us who still don't know that in Christ there is neither east nor west, north nor south, but one great human family in a house that grows smaller and smaller by the years. We pray not only for ministers of the gospel, but also for people of the gospel, since all who believe are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray not only for fair weather, but also for bad weather, since nature is impartial and often prodigal, and human estimates of good and bad do not count. We pray not only for sinners to turn and be saved, but also for the rest of us who think we have no sin and are in greater need of penitence and healing. And finally, we, Lord, we pray not only for others, but for ourselves, because salvation and righteousness begins at the household of God. Today, we pray especially for our black brothers and sisters. We pray for the people in the city of Buffalo. We pray for peace across our world. We pray for Robert Huntley, for Caleb, for Jackie, for Bonnie, for Dottie, for Ken and Audrey, for Diane, for Mary, for Jen, for Tina, for Lynn, for Sophia, for, Sophia, for Simona, for Steve, for Ralph, for June, for Lil, for Marianne, and for Robert Stitcher. Are there others we would like to lift up in joy or concern at this time? Yes. Bangkok Buffalo. Bangkok Buffalo brought 25 to 30 boxes of food, so that is a great joy. Sandy, did you have another one? From there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of 
Macedonia and the Roman colony. We remained in the city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we were supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to a woman who had gathered there, a certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Theranium and a dealer of purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart and listened eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel attributed to John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called, in Hebrew, Bethzathos, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. I invite those who are able to rise and join in singing hymn number 143, This Is My Father's Work. Something has gone wrong. Maybe it's just something minor like 
you know, you put the dishes in the wrong cupboard because you're not thinking. When I was pregnant, or right after I had Clint, I remember putting the cereal in the fridge and the milk in the cupboard because mommy brain. Or maybe it is a major life-changing revelation that things are going downhill fast with your life your marriage, or your child, or your job, or bad news from your doctor. And we go, oh, we either fix it fast, or worst of all, find the downhill slide irreversible, and uh-oh uh -oh becomes, oh God, please help me. <laughs> the oops moments are rarely positive ones. Now, we just read an oops moment in the life of an everyday man around Jesus when he miraculously healed the paralyzed man whom no one had helped into the healing waters of Bethsheba outside of Jerusalem Sheep Gate. But we probably passed right over that oops moment and didn't get it. The oops moment wasn't the miracle. It was when the miracle happened. No doubt, by this very active time in his earthly ministry, Jesus had gained notoriety and most like, likely tremendous popularity. He was an articulate and charismatic teacher for sure. He was rumored to be the political messiah that the people of Israel had dreamed about for the entire time that they had shifted from a grand monarchical people to an oppressed minority in and out of exile. With building momentum, Jesus was teaching all over Palestine, working miracles, magnificent healing miracles that were thrilling and made for terrific gossip and had not upset anyone yet. But then, oops, John's offhanded comment mentions at the end of his healing story that Jesus performed the miracle on the Sabbath. It's easy to miss it. It's what a comedian might call a throwaway line. This story is bookended with Jesus coming to Jerusalem with a festival. We're not sure which Jewish, Jewish festival. And ends when he heals on the Sabbath. If this text were read aloud by anyone who knew what happened, this line would be shouted, He healed on the Sabbath? No, wrong. It's not done. It's against the law. The law of Moses and the prophets, the scribes and the Pharisees, and we almost missed it. Here we have the beginning of our Lord's persistent message that he has come to fulfill the law of his ancestors, not simply to add one more grand legal code that would top the others. It was a new law, a totally transforming new direction that we now understand is the gospel in all its fullness. What people steeped in a 15th century tradition would just roll over and say, okay, sounds good for me. It didn't look good for Jesus from then on, and we know where it got him, nailed to the cross. He was headed straight for Calvary because the cross is the ultimate expression of this new law, a law of unconditional love and sacrifice that Jesus was telling everyone who had ears to hear and eyes to see that was greater than any human-made legal system. God intervened through Jesus to redeem the world with a vision of his kingdom based on compassion, justice, and wholeness for one and all that is greater than whether or not he worked a miracle on the Sabbath. So here we are all these many years later, and we find ourselves as Christians in a tricky position. Yes, life needs to be orderly. We are people who follow the rule of the law, 
but our Savior embodied a radical kingdom where God is always calling us to a higher place. Frankly, it makes being a Christian an enormously risky way of life. If we look at the power in a resurrection to life, we celebrate this Easter season. We could step traditiously every time we go to church or have the audacity to admit we are Christians and dare to act like it. When we do, we confess that we have come to worship a God who takes us into a life that is one of challenge and an invitation to make God's kingdom our only true home and law and to bring it to earth right here, right now. Isn't it ironic then that the church and the Christian faith are seen as stodgy by so many people? Or if not stodgy as an institution existing only to make sure the golden rule is enforced and enforced with a lot of pomp and circumstance that is off-putting to those who don't see it, the breathtaking truth of the gospel that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, that we are all one in Christ Jesus. How important is this quote in the midst of everything going on in Buffalo this week? One person thought he was better than others, simply based on the color of his skin. And yet, and yet, we are told in the Bible that we are all one in Christ Jesus. I invite you today to accept God's invitation to the audacious pilgrimage. I invite you to a life lived for others, to help the lame find the water of healing. It's an invitation to take up your cross and follow the risen one who might put us in the crosshairs with the ways of this world. It is so much more than faith buys us an eternal insurance policy. It is a faith of good news in this very moment, this second in your life, when we fully live with Christ now to fulfill his love to rise up to the standards, to the kingdom, and to proclaim this good news to all nations. Unity is not simply an internet intellectual exercise. We can believe the same things, recite the same creeds, belong to the same denominations, but just that does not mean we all have unity. In his book, Soul Talk, Larry Crabb writes, which is worse, a church program to build community that doesn't get off the ground, or one person sitting every Sunday in the back of the church who remains unknown? A Sunday school class that once drew hundreds but now is dwindled to 30, or a Sunday school teacher whose sense of failure is never explored by a caring friend? A family torn apart by a father's drinking, his wife's frustration, and their third grader's learning disabilities, or a self-hating dad, a terrified mom, and a lonely little boy, three human beings whose beauty and value no one ever discovers. A national campaign that fails to gain the steam for the pro-life movement, or a single woman on her way home from an abortion clinic in the back seat of a taxi, taxi, a woman whose soul no one ever touches. We may notice the unknown pew sitter. We may wonder how the teacher of the now small class feels. We worry over each member of the torn up family, and we feel guilt and pain for a woman who has ended her baby's life. But we do what's easier. We design programs, we brainstorm ways to build attention, and in our outrage over divorce statistics and abortion numbers, we fight for family values. These are all good things, but we don't talk to the pusid. We don't ask the teacher how he's feeling. We don't invite the dad to play golf, the woman to play lunch, or the little boy to play with our children. 
We don't let the aborting woman know we care about her soul. That response to hurting people, I would label disunity. Disunity is not just fighting over personal preferences. It's not just leaving the church because someone hurts your feelings. It's not just gossip that tears down other members of the body. It's leaving needs unmet. It's failing to love people the way God would love. Unity is lived out in caring concerns for others. Let's end at the very beginning with this story of healing. John's Gospel says there was a crowd of people with withered limbs, blind eyes, sores, and all sorts waiting to get into the pool. The King James Version calls the crowd a great multitude. Are we not in some way waiting to be healed by the stirring waters? Are we not all part of that great multitude? of humans who can't quite get there on our own, who need help getting into that water? Well, the wrongdoing of Jesus that day in man's eyes makes us right in God's. We are all at the pool in need of the one who can take us to that holy and healing place. We all will find we can in his name pick up our net, walk, and serve sacrificially and shout to others. He who suffered for what he did for me is now the one I follow. 32 years ago on this program, which was then called the Protestant Hour, one of our Lutheran preachers ended his sermon with these words, which I am pleased to quote. This, the Sunday issue for Christians, is not that of blue laws, but of golden opportunities. Its concern is not on what you do not do. It's, it is on what you are privileged to do. It is a time to realign our lives to plumb line of his truth. So may it all be for us. Amen. Our God does not give as the world gives. In the chaos, God is peace. In our fear, God is our confidence. In our weakness, God is our strength. Let us offer our gifts to God. The morning offering will now be brought forward. our Messiah. Amen. There are a few announcements this morning. The voice has been printed. We're working on getting it emailed out to you, but there are copies out in the narthex if you would like to take one. I will be working to get in the next week or so, probably a week or so to everybody, the new wise covenant set out and which will be voted on at the meeting on June 19th. So probably a week or two before June 19th, you will have the new wise covenant for you to look through and vote on. Sandy went through the shed. Would you like to say something, or would you like me to just say something? Uh, it's all in the bulletin, but there's a deadline. If you would like to look through the shed and see if there's anything that you could repurpose, please make arrangements with me. It's not a free for all. You just don't go in the shed and pick a brand new stranger. 
So if you need anything from the shed, see Sandy, don't just go take something because she might be using it. And then you're in trouble. Um, there are some new library books in the library that the WISE community, the WISE committee donated. Please feel free to check those out. And Jackie, did you want me to say something or do you want to say something about the chicken barbecue? Um, it's coming up. <laughs> Go forth in the love of God.